Now you talk about terror. What about for me? I've been terrorized all my day. Hammer all my day. The Israeli attacks on Gaza have included systematic assaults on Gaza's cultural and educational institutions. Israel has damaged or destroyed all 12 of Gaza's universities, some 280 government schools, and 65 UNRWA-run schools or UN-run schools have also been destroyed or damaged, often resulting in dozens of fatalities. About 133 remaining schools are used to shelter those displaced by the Israeli assault. More than 85% of Gaza's 2.3 million people have been driven from their homes amid continued Israeli ground and air attacks that have killed more than 25,000 people, including 10,000 children. The Geneva-based independent Euro Med Human Rights Monitor reported that Israel destroyed Gaza's 12 universities in stages The first stage including the bombing of the Islamic and Al-Azhar universities. On January 17th, the Israeli military detonated 315 mines to turn Gaza's last standing university, Al-Isra University, south of Gaza City, into rubble. The Israelis have occupied or had occupied the university for 70 days, using it as a military base, including positioning snipers within its buildings, as well as turning it into a detention and interrogation center. The university housed a museum with 3,000 archaeological artifacts dating back to the Roman era. University authorities have charged Israeli soldiers with looting the museum before blowing it up. Al-Isra University was home to the only university hospital in the Gaza Strip, one of only two in all of the Palestinian occupied territories, as well as buildings that housed medical and engineering laboratories, nursing labs, media training studios, the law colleges, court trial, and graduation halls. The Israeli attacks have killed 94 university professors. These include Professor Sufan Taya, the president of the Islamic University of Gaza, an award winning physicist and UNESCO Chair of Astronomy, Astrophysics, and Space Sciences in Palestine, who died alongside his family in an airstrike. Dr. Ahmed Hamdi Abu Absa, Dean of the Software Engineering Department at the University of Palestine, reportedly shot dead by Israeli soldiers as he walked away, having been released from three days of enforced detention. Professor Mohammed Eid Shabir, professor of immunology and virology and former president of the Islamic University of Gaza. Professor Rafat Al-Arir, a poet and professor of comparative literature and creative writing at the Islamic University of Gaza, who was killed along with members of his family. Some 4,327 students have been killed and 7,819 others have been injured. 231 teachers and administrators have also been killed. Palestinians, who have one of the highest poverty rates in the world, nevertheless cherish education. They also have one of the highest literacy rates in the world. And Palestinian graduates excel in medicines, mathematics, engineering, and other fields. Israel appears determined to obliterate Palestinian cultural, educational, and historical properties, part of its planned erasure of the Palestinian people. Images of Israeli troops cheering as schools are blown up have appeared on social media, including one video showing the demolition of a distinctive blue UN school in northern Gaza. Joining me from Cairo to discuss Israel's wholesale destruction of Gaza's educational and cultural institutions is Dr. Ahmed Al-Husani, the Vice President of 
Al Isra University. Dr. Al Husani's home block in Gaza was bombed by Israel, resulting in the death of 102 of his family members. So, Doctor, thank you for joining us. And of course, my heartfelt condolences, not only for your personal loss, but for everything that has been happening in Gaza. Thank you, Chris, for having me. I want to begin with what it took to build this university um, and how important the university was. Uh, uh, and, And I think we should also note that this isn't the first time that Israel has struck or bombed universities. They did so uh, in previous assaults. But let's begin with the university itself, because Gaza is is very poor, one of the most densely populated uh, in areas on the planet. And and to to build that structure and create what you created is almost Herculean. So talk about the inception of the university and what you built. Uh, the, The university was established in 2014. We started teaching in the fall of 2015. Uh, you know, we started with a small building north of Gaza, which also was demolished, like partially, or like 70% demolished during this war. It's you know on the north, close to the north of Gaza, like. And when we start, I would, at the same time, at two years later, we started building this this campus, which is a 4,000 square meters of of area on multiplied by seven floors it was you know the one of the biggest buildings in if it's not the biggest building in gaza and we had the designs and you know we had a lot of hope uh was a bunch of pioneers that we had we had the you know everybody you know pitched in we had you know we spent years building that building and we we followed every single detail of it we it was by witnesses of everyone in Gaza, everybody visited the, the building. It was it's one of the best buildings, one of the nicest buildings in Gaza. Uh, we, you know, we had like, it looks like a hotel when you walked in. I mean, one of the best, everything was so elegant, was luxurious, actually. We tried to make it, you know, one of a kind. And we had so many hopes for this. Uh, we actually had, you know, like, like you said, laboratories. We had... Uh, everything we had 4300 students even we haven't even been 10 years 4300 students 65 percent two-thirds more than two-thirds were females so we were you know we had given opportunities to a lot of females even when they were mothers and you know single mothers or the uh, they were in home because we had offered so many scholarships we had our vision our motto was poverty will stand will not stand an obstacle front of any Palestinian who wants to pursue a college degree. So well, that's what we started with. And that's our was our you know slogan or motto for that. And that's what, one of the main reasons we started this university. And, and that was the focus of everyone. So we were helping, we were giving so many scholarships to a lot of people. We were, you know, getting help. We had donations from Kuwait, from other, you know, UNDP we were working with. A lot of actually NGOs and international organization, and we were helping a lot of people. Even if they don't have, you know, they didn't have the money, we were giving a scholarship to Excel students. You know, who was ninety percent or more, a three point six average get a, you know, get a, a full scholarship. Women gets, you know, women are uh, divorced or whatever minorities get full scholarships. Uh, orphans, you know, of they, they have their parents die, would they give them? Also, a full scholarship. We have, you know, we were giving up so many, so much help. And like you said, uh, we were about to, to to do a grand opening of the museum. The museum we had, you know, we just built a building next to the, this campus, which also was destroyed this time. We had a nice building in there. We would, we had everything in there, and then it was loaded out and destroyed. Everything went away in in the blink of an eye. We were also built. Your university hospital, like you said, the first university hospital in Gaza. We, we just started teaching, you know, opened the program a couple of weeks, a week before, you know, we started the season, we started the semester for the Bachelor of Medicine. And we just started this a new program, not even a week teaching, and then everything was gone. Everything. Yeah. When did you leave the university? Or when did you leave Gaza? Uh, I, I had spent 45 days 
I left uh, November 14th. And I was in the north. I was like in the middle of the city of Gaza. So except I was on the south side. I can, you know, uh, we went to a, a horror leaving from the north to the south. Uh, we, when we left, you know, the Israeli IDF was on Salah al which is the the main road that connects between the north and south of Gaza. That's the main road. And the Israeli tanks and soldiers were there. So you have to go through them. Everything else you can't go because that's what they announced you have to go through that. You go there and then you stand, you know, you have to walk because there's no cars. They don't allow any cars to come in contact. Uh, we, you have to pull the bag into sand. There's no pavement because everything was uprooted by, you know, there's already bulldozers or whatever. So you have to pull the bag. And then you, once you get to, right before you get to the Israeli army, there was like containers they have to walk through. There was cameras in there and all kind of stuff. You walk in there and then you, then like they get, poor, you know, patches of 150, 200 people. You stand in front of soldiers, you're facing them and you have to hold your bag, your ID in your hand and standing up. We, we were like in this position for two and a half hours. Standing in your feet in the sun with your ID holding in your hand. If you drop something, you can kneel down or bend down to pick it up because you subject yourself to a death sentence. You can get sniped out by it. They can get killed. And while you're staying there, you stand there and with you know within that two and a half hours, they were calling people. They they have you know they were like a, a hundred yards from us, and they have ditches in the ground between them. They call you, they say, oh, you're, you, the donkey with the red shirt. That is what, that's how they call you, you know, humiliation. They call you, you come, come out here. You come out there, you go into a small ditch and you stand there, you make your stand, you make it, I mean, they make people on random, I don't know, there was a random one, they were by the cameras or whatever. They make you take all your clothes off, totally, fully naked, even your underwear, you hold it in your hand. And then after that, they either come out, blindfold you, handcuff, and they take you in. Or some people they just make them sit there the next day, use them as a human shield, so they won't get, you know, people won't get shot and stuff, whatever. Uh, all this humiliation, you know, 70 years old man had to stand in there and take all his clothes off and make him turn around in front of the people. There was women, there was kids standing, women were crying, kids were crying. My granddaughter was with me. She's three years old. She was, she was horrified, you know. And once you pass through, like two and a half, two hours and a half later, they make you walk to where we go. Whoever left, you just have to walk. Then you walk up another mile, and then you find you find a cart, a donkey that is pulled by a donkey. That's what the only thing allowed there. It's gonna take you another mile to to get to where cars are supposed to be. Then you we found some old car. We took we rode to to the border to the Rafa border. And you, you were in northern Gaza. Did you leave because you were ordered to leave or because your, where your home was destroyed? Yeah, my home was destroyed. It's, it's unlivable. And we had no choice. And then um, we, we couldn't, there's nowhere to go. And you either go to the south or go leave. And we had a chance to live with my family through the State Department. They had our names like, you know, as, you know dual citizens. And we went through straight to, through Rafa, of course. That's that. I'm even, I forgot to mention, once you cross past the IDF, we, while you're walking, there was bodies on both sides of the road. There was bodies, dec it started decomposing. You can see them, I mean. And so let's talk about the assault on educational and cultural institutions. Uh, it's clearly by design. I mean, this is not accidental. What is it that Israel, why is it that Israel is determined to obliterate educational and cultural institutions, and there are many that I haven't mentioned, including Gaza's public library, Gaza's cultural center. Why are these important targets for the Israelis? I guess, I think they, they want to wipe out everything that's, that points to the Palestinian identity or Palestinian culture. It's like they, they, they're, they're uh, propaganda says there were people with no land, came to a land with no people. They consider this, there was no Palestinians, and they're still saying it till now. Oh, there was no people there. There's no such thing as Palestine. There was no Palestinian people in there. So who was there? Who was living there? Where were my grandparents and my grand-grand-grandparents? Have their, they still have the keys for their homes in there. They have currencies 
the state, state of Palestine, the old, you know, currency is in 1927 and 19, 1918. How, where did that come from? And the state, state of Palestine. Actually, there was a manhole cover in Yaffa, on Jaffa, right, still right now. I, I saw somebody posted a picture of that it stays on the state of Palestine. They probably forgot to, to take that out too. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but, you know, they like, um, they don't want your people to, you know, to educate themselves. They don't want education. They want to destroy schools, universities, uh, because that's the only way the Palestinian had. We don't. We have. We had no weapon. We had no future. So we, every Palestinian in Gaza, as I know, they were deprived themselves from food, and they will send their kids to college. And it, I just, like, it, it becomes it becomes like a you know necessity is a must. Everybody send their kids to college. They have to. They don't let them you know just after high school and sit down. They force them or they ask them to go to college, and even the, the young, the young children, the young kids are convinced that you have you build a future and you can re get your country back if, by educating yourself. You know you can't be illiterate and you know you can't represent yourself in front of anybody. And they said, like I said, um, it's not just that they uprooted olive trees. Olive trees, you know, it's a symbol for Palestinian. Land and they like you see you see what happens in the West Bank. The settlers every other day they go onto the uh, out of fields of trees and they uproot a lot of them and they burn them and <clears throat> it's it's a war against everything that is Palestinian. Uh, the, and the, it's another thing they wanted to make Gaza unlivable. You know, if, if you have no hospitals, no schools, you know, universities, no mosques to pray, uh, no place to go. What what else? What would you have there? It, they won't be alive in there. And, you know, it's really shocking what they did to the university. Why would you stay in it for 70 days and then go, you know, booby trapped it and blow it up in front of people while cheering? And, you know, I don't understand. You was there for for how long? I mean, and I seen the American spokesman for the State Department said, oh, they said it was it was headquarters for Hamas. It was never been in a Hamas there. I don't understand how, where did that come from? There was no weapon. If they had something, they would have had videos and pictures, or they would taste something like they did in a Shifa hospital or whatever. You know, I I don't know what to say to anymore. I think pal if I remember, uh Palestinians have a ninety seven percent literacy rate. I mean, it's really high. Yes. Like I said, everybody uh, make sure they, they go to school. And I also, in terms of Palestine, just for viewers who may not know. From the Muslim conquest in the seventh century until the creation of the State of Israel in 1948, historic Palestine, which before World War I was under the Ottoman Empire, was a Muslim entity. It was Muslim. Yes. And, and much of what Israel seeks to accomplish is really a kind of not just an erasure of Palestinian cultural and historic identity, but really a kind of form of historical amnesia. Yes, and that's exactly what I wanted to say. Is, uh, they... um, let's talk about some of the figures, Rafat and others. You know, they have killed, and, one, and of course, over 100 journalists. To a certain extent, uh, you know, for those of us who are watching it from a distance, it seems clear that some or many of these people were clearly targeted. They weren't killed accidentally. And I think with Rafat that there's a, uh, you know, he was receiving threats from Israel before they bombed him. And I think he was killed with his sister and his family. But they have, they have really wiped out, along with the journalistic class, and of course foreign journalists are not allowed into Gaza, so we can't cover I was part of a group from the Egyptian press syndicate that were tried to go to Rafa to protest a few weeks ago. Um, but I, 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 I want you to address this issue of the killing of leading academics, leading poets, writers, you know, what your reflections on it are and whether you believe they were deliberately targeted by the Israelis. Yes, I do. Uh, like I said, mainly uh, most of these people are prominent figures. They known 
And they, uh, what I heard, that actually, they're typing them through their Facebook accounts and their you know social media accounts right now. And anybody that publishing something or you know posting anything, you get threats. Sometimes it's direct threats. Sometimes it's indirect threats. You know, you post something even simple on on Facebook. You know, you get something. You get notified. Sometimes you get phone calls. You get this recording phone calls from the Israeli army that you have to leave your house or whatever. And sometimes it's uh, you, you don't know what's going. On. I I hear I seen journalists get you know one of the journalists that was in uh, in the north in Jabali come uh, his name is Anas Sharif I think he got text messages that were threatening him to stop because you know when Al Jazeera left <clears throat> only this guy was you know videoing in the north he's the one who was staying then he bombed his house killed his father and he's still there I don't know if he's still alive or not you know there's so many cases of journalists were getting threats and killed there's uh, so many academics you know. They were killed. And we have one few from the, you know, our Israel University. <clears throat> we have Dr. Fadal Abu Hin, is a professor of uh, clinical psychology. He's a prominent psychologist for 30 years. He was working for the Gaza Clinical, you know, Mental Health Center. And he was retired. Then he came to work for us and he was teaching in clinical psychology department. He was the head of the clinical psychology department. You just killed two weeks ago, or less, maybe three weeks, uh, with his family also. His mom to his house. Rafat al Arair was, you know, uh, he was, I guess he was bothering him with his poetry and his, you know, his fighting for, you know, he was always posting things about Palestine, you know. Uh, Dr. Safiyan Tahir, like you said, the president of Islamic University, he's a prominent physic, you know, physics, physicist, you know, he's known for, I think he was number one on Palestine, number one, one, one of the tenth of, on the people on the world for physics. And I don't know why would you kill somebody like that. He has nothing to do with anyone. And you bomb their house with their family. They know who's there before they bomb. They, you know, after with this new technology right now, <clears throat> they know who's in there through their cell phones and uh, all other technology, even with the voice recognition and stuff. So they know who, who's in the house before they bomb the house. And it looks like this was deliberate targeting all these people on purpose, I guess, to rid. Gaza or Palestine of intellectuals and and future and a good future education of future. Um, these people are very well known scientists, and the most of them are killed with in cold blood with their families and even ch children. Some of them with their grandchildren were wiped out with the whole family wiped out. Some of them, you know, left a little kid or a father or whatever. But most of the families are wiped off this. Civic, civic register. I don't know what else we can say. I mean, it's it's there. Everybody sees it that it's, it's deliberately targeted. But I don't know. The United States doesn't want to see it. The State Department spokes, but doesn't want to see it. And you could see him trying to defend. I see so many, you know, press conference for him and with, with journalists and asking him. He try, you know, to avoid question and say, I don't know. I don't have enough information to. To comment on that, we still wait and we ask Israel for comment or explanation. We didn't get, I never heard him say, I got an explanation. I don't know. Well, I, I think the U.S. understands very well what Israel is doing. It is carrying out not only genocide, but also uh, attempting to create a situation or a, a humanitarian catastrophe that is so extreme that Palestinians will have to choose between dying of exposure, disease, bombs, starvation, or infectious disease, or leaving. I mean, I think that's clearly the goal, whether Israel can achieve that goal, because of course, where are the Palestinians going to go? I don't know. But, uh, and having covered Israel for seven years, this has long been the intent of Israeli political figures like Netanyahu. It's not, they've not, uh, it's not a secret. I mean, they have long advocated for this wholesale ethnic cleansing. Um, are you in touch with anyone in Ga within Gaza at the moment? Yes, I mean it's very hard, but we get. I still have brothers and sisters back there. I have brother and couple of sisters in the north, still in the middle, still in Gaza City, mm -hmm. and I have one of my brothers with his family in San Yunus right now. San Yunus with all this bombing right now. He he, you know, he evacuated too, where they told him to go. 
they said go to Khan Yunus, which was fine, it was safe. And now he's it's the worst area right now for him. It's just, you know, every day is bombing close to his where he's staying and is he's so scared for his life. He sent me messages sometimes, you know, just saying if we might not make it to the morning. And that's why we had I was feeling that same thing when we were staying at the beginning of the war for the, over 40 days. That's what we we're feeling, you know, the bombing, the house shakes, and you don't know when the next hit will be. We say our prayer, we gather together in one room so we can die together, and we don't know if we're going to make it in, to the morning. Nobody knows. You know, we say your prayers and go to sleep, and we say goodbye to everybody, if you can sleep. What do you think the end goal of Israel is? And how achievable do you think their goal is? I mean, they say that this is a war against Hamas. I think the evidence argues against that. It's a war against the Palestinian people. Uh, a few days ago, U.S. intelligence uh, reports that were uh, reported in the New York Times said that only 20 or 30 percent of Hamas fighters had been killed and that I was surprised Hamas had the capabilities to continue resistance for two or three months. Uh, but uh, just, you know, from your perspective, what is Israel's goal? What is, how achievable is that goal? I think the goal, the goal is, is to uh, evacuate people from Gaza. I think they want Gaza empty land. Uh, that's what they've been planning even for years. They said it before. I think one of their, their leaders said it before that Gaza has to be emptied out, uh, you know, it's, it's imposed. I don't know if this is part of the, uh, I guess, the deal of the century. Um, that's what they do when they want to make it unlivable. Like I say, they want to make it, people have no choice but to leave. Either you die there of bombing, let alone fame, famine or starvation or hunger or thirst or diseases that's spreading right now because of all the bodies that is out there. Uh, they want to make it unlivable, make them migrate. I think their goal is to go to push people into the Sinai Desert, into Egypt. And and it's up, it's going step by step. It's so it's already almost there. Now it's almost 2 million people at one point. Like what I heard is 1.5 or 1.7 million are already in Rafa, right close to the border. I saw pictures of tents like less than 20 feet from the border, the Egyptian border. So the people are there, you know. They're ready to go. Mm -hmm. If they start bombing from the north, I think that's what is going to happen. My, my own belief, they're going to start bombing, pushing people toward the border. Then they bomb the walls of the border, make it open, and people will run for their life. They're going to go in there, and then once they go in there, they seal it, and it's stopping from coming in or back to their places. If uh, What stopped them, the people's steadfastness in the north. They, there's a lot of people still there. They don't want to leave their houses. Nobody wants to leave. A lot, some people left, but a lot of people are still there. There's big numbers are still in the north, in Jabalia and other places. And uh, that's actually delayed their, I think that's delayed, mm -hmm. that had delayed their plans for, now it's the fourth month start already, uh, 120 days. Uh, but there is a lot of people. If if they don't, if they can't do that, I think they will just uh, take Push the whatever who's left in Rafa and and stay with the half mm -hmm. of the half of the, the population or more than half population. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, they have this policy it's called you know mowing the grass. I don't know if you hear that. Yeah, that's that's they were doing that every every few years, every couple of years there was a war mm -hmm. on Gaza. Yeah, let me just explain. Mowing the grass was Israeli slang for periodically carrying out armed assaults, including aerial attacks against Palestinians in Gaza to. Uh, as a form in their eyes of deterrence to keep them under control, in which, of course, thousands of Palestinians were killed. Yeah, of course. I think that's what the, is a target. They want to kill numbers. They, so they don't want to, the numbers to go up. They, they even when the blockade was there, they were control, They were counting the calories. How many calories yeah. are, are we supposed to consume in Gaza? They, they go by one person to another. And they were controlling the food. They, they measure the food, how much food you need to go. So. Yeah, for all that the past seventeen years, with the blockade in there, they were controlling everything that going in and out of Gaza. The food was proportionate. They were not giving you enough food. They were not giving you healthy food. You know, some some stuff were even forbidden. Uh, laboratory equipment. We had 
in our own case, we had purchased a PC, you know, PCR, a CPR, a CPR unit for, you know, with, with the, during the COVID-19 the COVID spread. And it was coming in. And then it's, since then, it's been there. At their, they, they blocked it from coming. They, they didn't allow it to come into Gaza. I don't know why. This is a, no, no permission for this. And one, another instrument we had to wait for a year and a half. And we had the, uh, the ICRC, the Red Crescent, and to help us to get mm -hmm. that from the Israeli side. So um, all kind of obstacles hinder mm -hmm. for, for everything. You know, when you, when you want to build something, if you you know that like when you build the building material, the cement, you have to register and know, and you have to tell them exactly where the cement is going. And you have to show that you have used the cement. And there was cameras at the warehouse, the UN staff, UN DP, I think, was staff was there, and they have to calculate every ton of cement, where is it going and who is it going for and what is it used for. Mm -hmm. That was a policy for the past 10 years at least, since the war, I think 2014. You can't bring anything unless they monitor or agree to let it in. And that's part of also making Gaza unlivable for people. I mean, you have economic hardship, you have a siege, a blockade, you can't travel. Through them, you know, one percent you get the permit to travel. Uh, you they deny your entry, they deny you to leave. You go through the Egyptian side, also, it was you know, you know, the first few years was closed, the the border was closed for like 200 days out of the you know, the year, and now it started you know, opening, but also with just a lot of restrictions. A lot of you know, you know, you have there's you have to pay people, there's a bribery. If you can hear now, you have to bribe somebody to get out of Gaza. Yes, and those bribes are in the thousands of dollars. Five thousand dollars right now. Five thousand. Now we're talking about uh, Egyptians who they announce will allow people to get out. They have advertisement that shows. I didn't believe it. They they advertise that. I oh. mean, they are not even ashamed of it. It says five thousand per person, at twelve hundred dollars if you carry a, a Egyptian passport or a, a Egyptian citizenship. Um, and we should also mention that the Israelis have announced that they are going to make an assault on Rafa. So yeah, it's, it, well, I think they're about to go in there. Yeah, which I is right on the border with yeah. Egypt. That's where the border crossing is. I think this uh, is part of the plan, and it's still going in there. I don't know if Egypt would allow this or not. So hopefully not. And uh, God knows. I'm wondering what this means for the Palestinian people. In many ways, what's happening in Gaza is even worse than the so-called Nakba, uh, the catastrophe uh, Palestinians caused call it in 1948 when 750,000 Palestinians were ethnically cleansed from historic Palestine. Thousands were murdered by Zionist terrorist groups and villages like Deir Yassin. Um, how do you place this moment in Palestinian history? What, what, is this, what does this mean for the Palestinian people? I think this is, from my own opinion, this is second Nakba. I mean, even worse, third Nakba, let's say 1948, 1967, and now. 2023 or 24 right now. Um, my uncle, he's, he's, he was 95 years old. Probably uh, he was killed also in the last bombing of our blocks, of, you know, with uh, our family. Um, he saw he saw the Nakba. He left through the Nakba. He was a teen at that time, or maybe 20 years old. Uh, he said that this is what you know. This is another Nakba, but it's a much larger and much horrifying scale. Uh, he never seen this kind of, you know, killing and targeting, a deliberate targeting of mosques, hospitals, schools. I mean, you know, this is the worst, you know, that ever. I mean, I never even seen it in any other in the world that you deliberately, you know, attack a, a, a hospital or university and, you know, what patient in, in the hospital and, and unplug or stop the fuel from going in there for children or babies and any people die and there people dying of all kind of stuff there was a, a deliberate actually killing there was assassination they were gathering people and shooting them in the back of the head and then they were they found now they find bodies that you know buried with their, their hands behind their back tied mm -hmm. so it's, it's a lot of you know executions and you know like i said this is a third nakba and the thing they want to do it because one of their leaders, they're saying that they, they regret keeping Palestinians during the 1948 
inside Israel. They won't even want to get rid of the people who was living, Israeli Arabs, they say, in 1948 people. Uh, they say they should have, we should have got rid of, we should have never left anybody in there. And think now they want to say what, or they want to do what they, what they couldn't do in 1948. They want to get rid of everybody in there. And if this works, I think the next turn is they're going to go to the West Bank and kick them to Jordan. I think that's part of a bigger plan. Uh, and that's what makes me believe that and make people should believe that, that Netanyahu in the United Nation, he held the map and it didn't show no West Bank on Gaza, if you can remember that. Was yeah, you're talking about it was in September. He addressed the General Assembly and he held up a map of the future of the Middle East and it showed Israel having incorporated the occupied West Bank and Gaza into one country. That's right. Yes. That's what I'm talking about. What do you think the consequences are for Palestinians? You obviously have tens of thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of people who have been so deeply traumatized. You yourself have lost extensive family members. Children are going to you know, grow up with this not only this trauma, but having lost close relatives, maybe their parents, their homes, their community. How is this going to play out among the Palestinian people? You have roughly 5.5 uh, million Palestinians living under Israeli occupation and about 9 million Palestinians living in the diaspora. What is this? What is this? Uh, what are going to be the consequences among the Palestinians? I think the after this, uh, the, uh, the Palestinian people have reached a point of despair. Uh, I don't think that anybody now thinks there is a future for peace with Israelis. Uh, before that, it was it was divided. It was a lot of people that believed that we could live, we can have our own state, and they can have their state and two state solutions. And I don't know what they're doing. Uh, I think they're left the rightist extremists, they destroy that hope for everybody. And I don't think that's going to work anymore. If, Like you said, if all these kids that they had they lost their parents, lost their relatives, lost their homes, what are they think? They think they're going to gonna want to live in a, in a one state or two states next to say somebody who killed their parents. I think they are they are destroying the, the two-state solution at all, and that's what they wanted to do since years or tens of years. Since de decades, because Netanyahu said that he doesn't believe that should be a Palestinian state, and uh, they don't want it, and they they want a one-state solution for themselves by themselves. They want a Jewish state like they passed the law a couple of years ago. Uh, they don't want Palestinians, and the extremists are holding power in Israel, and that's what they want. And I think uh, they're, they're getting a lot of, of full support from the United States, and it doesn't seem it's gonna it's gonna the, that support is diminished. No, I think it's is is growing more, especially if you know between Republican and Democrat. It's it's not diminishing at all. I don't know what you know what to expect. The kids are in despair. We feel in this in, in despair. Uh, I'm not so optimistic about the future. Uh, I don't know if, when are we going to be able to even go to Gaza and start building. Gaza is just totally destroyed. Like you say, more than seventy percent of the houses and buildings are are uh, turned into rubble. Uh, everything is destroyed. Uh, schools are gone. Universities, hospitals, mosques, uh, medical centers. What do, what can we expect? I mean, what kind of life are we ever going to go back to to start this kind of stuff? And what about the consequences within the region? Because I think you know, with much justification, within the Arab and the Muslim world, this is just seen not only as an assault on Palestinians, but an assault on Muslims, an assault on Arabs. And there's been tremendous unrest, uh, which has put pressure on Arab regimes that have, beyond rhetorically denouncing the genocide, haven't really done much with the exception of Yemen. What, uh, wh what is the, how is this going to play out within the region? To be honest with you, I don't uh, think there's a lot of change. Like you said, there's not much condemnance. Like they condemned at the beginning, not, not, they're not even condemning now. And like uh, Eddie Cohen, one of the journalists, so you don't say this. If a lot of Arab countries are supporting our operation in Gaza, they, some of them are funding it. They want to get rid of whatever left of resistance in Gaza and Palestine. 
they want to finish this struggle and get get rid of it because uh, I guess they this part of uh, is like you say is giving them unrest, giving them a headache because the people on the Arab countries and the Muslim are still you know li- alive. They they want a solution. They they want to stop the killing in all the countries, even the the neighboring countries to Gaza, Jordan, you know, Egypt, all other countries. But it's still, it's not, it's not. They're not moving. They're not, you know, the guy, you know, the leaders of those countries are not doing much, or they're not doing enough to ease that suffering or to stop the genocide, the ethnic cleansing, they stop the killing. They're not even trying. They're not even saying it. They didn't even uh, some of them. They didn't even, you know, call their ties or they cut their t- political ties. They say or economic ties with Israel. No, they're supporting that. You, as you can see, also I heard that. They have trucks coming from Dubai through Saudi Arabia to Jordan, bringing all kind of merchandises and stuff to Israel to, I guess, to make up for the loss through the Red Sea, that what the Yemenis is stopping. So I don't know if that's ever going to change. And I think the leaders are worried about their position and their authority to, to lose their power. Uh, but I think that's too early for that. Maybe they, you know, in the future, they, this maybe this will start. It started, you know, I, I guess it started a domino effect, but it's going to take time to start. I don't think it's going to be a time soon. That's my own uh, thinking. Great. Thank you. That was Dr. Ahmed Al Husseina, Vice President of Al Asra University. I want to thank the Real News Network and its production team Cameron Granandino, Adam Coley, David Hebden, and Kayla Rivera. You can find me at chrishedges.substack.com. Thank you so much for watching The Real News Network, where we lift up the voices, stories, and struggles that you care about most. And we need your help to keep doing this work. So please, tap your screen now, subscribe, and donate to The Real News Network. Solidarity forever.